Yes, there it is. Now we're recording. Cool. All right, <laughs> so you might want to run that back. No, no, we can skip out the whole lawsuit thing. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do oh, the disclaimer. No, the, the question. All right, full disclaimer, though. This isn't financial advice. This is just a, a finance show that we cover financial topics that me and Tommy are passionate about. Please do your due diligence. Talk to your lawyers. Talk to your accountants and things like that. My question to you is, before we get into the topics, do you do you wash your belts? Like the belts you wear with your jeans. Do you do wash them? Do you, did you ever wash your belt? Like, put that in the chat. Have you ever washed a belt in the chat? And I'm going to follow up with another question for y'all. So, yes or no, have you ever washed your belt? Nah, man. You know, I got the Gucci <laughs> belt I'm trying to show off. Took the shirt in. I'm not, I ain't washed that thing. All right. So, Tamari never washed her belts either, right? <laughs> so, here's the thing that was blowing my mind. Like, I was, I was coming up with topics one day. And I was just like, damn, people don't wash belts. But it's the first thing you touch after you use the bathroom, though. Like, when you go do a number two, you do your, you wipe it and then you touch your belt. So you just walking around with a dirty belt. Mad germs. Bro, this is how Corona got started. <laughs> it starts spraying the lice on my belt. Mad now. germs on the belt. <laughs> nah, all right. All right. So let's, let's get into it. Let's get into it. All right. The, the last thing is I, I realized something like, um, you know, you ever notice when you're a teenager, you drive like you don't have no time in the world, but like senior citizens drive like they got all the time in the world. So that's another little weird thing I was thinking about. Like older people just got it so much better, I guess, because they seen it all and done it all. Um, all right, let's get into the first topic. I won't kill y'all with more of my dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, so the first thing let's talk about this is you got 30 30 K for for like spending for crypto and NFT addiction. So so sir, her boyfriend lost thirty thousand dollars on his addiction to cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrencies and NFT. So I guess the first question is, have, have, have you or a significant other ever lost a significant amount of money on something? And how did that affect you? Right. Like what is that when you say, all right, if you're if you're, your wife come home like, oh, babe, I lost thirty thousand dollars doing this thing that I love. Or I lost $30,000 on crypto. Like, what is your first question? Like, how do you, how does that affect you? I mean, I think it's one, it's, you know, it's a conversation. Like you say, it's, it's a conversation. You get asked that question in, in the shoes I'm in now is like, what you mean? 30,000. How we, we just, <laughs> just give up 30,000 like that on, on what? Hmm. You know, so 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 from some reading this, I was looking at it from like two different perspectives, right? So I was looking at it from a, a personal finance side of the house. I know they're leaning on crypto and NFT, so that's the hot topic. But I looked at it as a a loss and something that this person is passionate about, right? So I, I took it back to she said boyfriend, but are is their money co mingled, right? So did they have a discussion on how they were going to invest the funds? before it was lost that's my first question my second question is is it a actual loss or is it a paper loss like for example a lot of people who are in the stock market now are down you're if you're in the s p 500 you're down nine percent at least if you're in a growth fund you're down not if you're in other types of stocks you're down 10 percent at least if you're in crypto right now i believe bitcoin is down 30 percent or close to 30 percent so is it a paper loss because you just lost some equity or did he like trade and lose like when you trade is gone right so that was my other question to it and, and does that matter to you like okay if you're you're a, you don't necessarily believe in crypto but your significant other believed in crypto and last year in 21 you know crypto went crazy and it's up and now they're down thirty thousand dollars does that change anything for you so the thing for for me is is it if it's money that we have, if it's not like the house money, like, okay, this is money that we need, we need to use on a day to day. So if it's something that's set aside for like, okay, we're going to invest in something and she went to go use it first and try a venture, whether it's a business, it's crypto or something like that. It's like, okay, this is what this was set to the side for. So I can kind of deal with that as opposed to it being money that we need on hand. Uh, I see what you're saying. Like if it was if y'all had a conversation, this is our investment fund because we know we have to invest if we are trying to be wealthy. Right. Whether it's in the stock market, whether it's in crypto, whether it's a business. So if it's for that, you're cool. But if it's like you woke up one day and it was like, ah, hey, you know, <laughs> the rent money <laughs> about that, you know, if it was the rent money, then we got a problem. Right. 
is that a break? Is that enough of a fence to make you break up with somebody though? Right. So if it's not the, if it's y'all didn't have a conversation, you woke up one day and let's just say the money's gone. Is that a, is that a conversation? Or are you know what? I'm done. I'm out. We breaking up. Um, at that, at that value, like 30 grand. It could be whatever number, right? It's the principal. Uh, to me, I'm thinking that's like the principal. Let's say 30 grand though. You woke up one day, you 30K short, and then you're, you're sniffing others like, yo, I invested in, in crypto because I really, really believe in this project. For for me, I think it, it is the amount. Like if it's something like, let's say it's a small amount, then we have that conversation. Okay, this is how we moved. Um, You made this move. Do we need to have discussions about this going forward? Something like 30K. I'm like, uh, no, nah, that's that's irresponsible. In, in my opinion, I'm like, I don't, I don't know. I might, I might have to. See, to me, I don't think the amount matters. I think it's the fact that we didn't talk about it matters. That that is true, too. I, I shouldn't be surprised. I shouldn't wake up surprised. Like, what? What happened? You did what? It shouldn't be. I shouldn't be blindsided by any amount. If we in it together, because then I'm going to think you, what is you really hiding from me? You, you see what I mean? Because it's like, yeah. it's like financial infidelity at the end of the day. Like right. if, if, if you wouldn't, why can't we just have a quick, you, you share everything else with me. You couldn't share the thing that you were so passionate about with me. See, it makes me think you doing something a little, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, seem, you seem like you a little wishy-washy, you like a little wishy-washy. But so the moral of this one is it, it seems like in their scenario, he is super passionate about crypto, definitely losing some money. She don't understand it. Apparently, I don't think their money is commingled. But if your money is commingled, I would say, guys, if you want to invest in something, whether it's your education, whether it's having more kids, whether it's traveling to a certain place, have a conversation with your significant other. And then at least you should be able to explain it to the point where they understand what you're talking about. If you can't explain it to the person that you love, chances are you don't know enough about it yet to be pursuing it that's how i kind of look at it too no yeah that makes that makes sense if you can't really explain it you don't really know enough like if i can't explain it for you to understand it you know even at the minimal level is is like that's not something you know about yourself yeah i mean it take take some time read another book about it (laughs) or two and then (laughs) present it to your significant other as like hey this is an opportunity that I would like us to go in as a partnership or I'm going to be moving to this opportunity. I'm going to let you know about it and at least explain it to them. That's why I think they should be doing. All right. That was, that was a, a cool one. What was the other one? What's the other one we had on going on next? Um, so with, with all the, the, the craziness going on in the world, um, the, the, the market, the market in Moscow, Mo- Moscow stock market has remained frozen for this is the third week has been frozen. So I believe like the day after the war started, that's when they shut everything down. Um, And I believe it's because like all the sanctions started coming. Now, I did do some research on this one. So back in the first world war, we did shut down the stock market a little bit as well. And from my understanding, they did this so people couldn't just take all their money out of Russian entities. Right. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of there's a lot of American money. A lot of pensions exposed to Russia. And if they can't sell, they can't just take all the money out at the same time and completely crash the stock market. Once you add in the fact that uh, if everyone made a run on those assets and completely left Russia at one time, everything will collapse. The whole economy be gone. So if they shut it down, you can't get your money out. It's going to go down like... Assets on the United States side have dropped like 25 to 30 percent over here. So typically you would expect the same thing to happen over there. The thing that is crazy, though, there are some people who put on puts and a put is the option contract where you have uh, the right or obligation to sell something at a certain time. So typically someone was shorting it. They were they bought a put and they were shorting the stock. So if a stock is here, they're saying I'm willing to bet. I will. I want to be able to sell the stock at this level. So if the stock still goes down and they're selling up here, they pretty much make the difference. If the Russian stock market is closed and I have an options contract, I can't liquidate. I think somebody missed out on like three hundred and seventy million dollars on one of their shorts because they can't get into the market to close their position. So they did that because they know their economy is going to crap. It's over. It's done. As soon as that market opens up, everything is dropping like a rock because they are deemed 
uninvestable now. That's why they shut it down. Three lost out on three hundred and seventy. It's, it's million? probably more than that now. You got to think about it. It's, it's a lot of institutions who can't even get their money out right at the moment. So if we just shut it off. We keep all those assets in, and you can't get your money out. So maybe. Uh, I think maybe they're angling for some form of negotiations or anything like that, but that's why they, they have it closed. Like as soon as the war started, no sanctions starts piling in. They was like, nope, shutting down the stock market. So everything over there is super. You don't you don't know how bad things are technically for them because you can't even look at the stock market and, and do a gauge of things. That is now. So imagine this. Imagine you have exposure to Russian companies. And say that's 20% of your portfolio. You are in limbo right now. You stuck. You short. You, you're no different than the oligarchs, the oligarchs over there who are being sanctioned, who can't move their money in the state. So it's kind of like you, you, you are in limbo. You have no clue what's going to happen when that market opens up. But I, I, I can bet dollars the donuts is going to drop. <laughs> it's, going, it's going to drop a whole lot. It's over See, with. Yeah. All right. So the next thing that's that's uh, was pretty interesting out there is is the goal. So let me just ask this. Right. You you work and you work for somebody and you've been off two years, these last two years at home, you know, able to make your breakfast when you want lunch when you want. You got everything fresh. You have you on your own leisure working at your own time. And then your CEO say, I want you to come back to the office full time. <laughs> Listen, listen, champ. I don't know, bro. That that's that's gonna be that's gonna be a hard no for me personally. Um, because I work for I I can I did the hour and a half commute, two hour commute at one point in time. This was before the pandemic, and the moment I got into position to be management, whether it's uh, I was a program manager, I implemented the first company wide telework policy because I was like, it ain't no way. <laughs> that I'm going to want to, it's like the, the commute is crazy. But then by the time I, you get to work, I don't want, I'm tired. I don't want to be at work. I'm tired. And then I got to be around Jane from accounting and, and the person who is eating people food in a lunchroom. And then I got another two out. Nah, nah, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to work. So <laughs> would you guys want to go back to work after being off for two years, have to commute back into the office an hour each way, have to get up early to get dressed, put your makeup on and so on and so forth? Is, is that something that you'd be willing to do? And then that daylight saving just hit. So it's dark when you out there trying trying to make that commute early in the morning. So I, I'm so, not trying to go back. <laughs> so, so to break down how how people were rebellion, rebelling. So uh, after shutting down after the Omicron wave, just 50 percent or about 5000 of the building's 10,000 workers returned to its New York headquarters, despite receiving more than two weeks notice. Right. So they was like, yo, in two weeks, <laughs> I'm going to need y'all all back in New York. And for the last two years, two and a half years, I was able to prove that I can work from home. You got to think about it. If you're in New York, the traffic is probably horrendous. It's probably horrible. Number two, your housing is a little bit different. So if you give me my New York East Coast salary and I can move to middle of the middle America or I can move to a Florida with that said salary and, and be work remote in the fun and the sun, you think I'm going to want to go back to the 1,000 square foot apartment in New York just to be close to work or the train with a lot of people? Heck no, man. Like y'all saying it in the chat. <laughs> a lot right. of people saying in the chat, like I work my business home from anyway. Uh, like Dorothy says, I'm I'm a nurse and looking for more work from home. How are you gonna work from home? Is it, how do... That that's an interesting one. Uh, if well, I guess it, that, it depends. It it depends on what kind yeah. of nurse she is. I, I yeah. I'm assuming uh, it's gonna be like a teleconference thing. Like you know, I need to get a prescription or something like that. So Tamara yeah. says commercial real estate is suffering. That is why I believe telehealth. That that's what it is. So I mean. But here's the thing, Tamara, Goldman Sachs is a financial institution. They don't care about commercial real estate, <laughs> right? Like they don't necessarily care about co commercial real estate. Um, but I just don't see when, when the telework craze started, this is, what, this, is what I, this is what I was thinking. I put my corporate hat on and I said, if I'm a middle manager and my only job was to manage people and to track time 
and to to ensure that people are doing what they're supposed to do within the office, then I'm nervous. I'm super nervous because my, my whole power, my whole job is derived from the old archaic system of people need to be in office around people to get work done. Without, and, and I, the, the other side of the coin I was thinking of, well, certain organizations do require you to be home. I'm sorry, not home, but in the office to get the best bang for your buck. If we're doing say, for example, developers, if we're all in a pit together and we're all working on something, it's something that you miss out by not being right next to the person. If maybe you're in a sales environment, possibly, and you're right next to the person who is the top salesperson in, in, in the company, which possibly is Goldman, they're, they're calling people all the time selling, maybe you miss out some of that mojo, jojo being next to them, but not everybody technically needs to be in the office to be effective. Right. So I think people realize that they, they probably realize like, wow, I like my work life balance. I, I like the fact that I can get up and only wear a top <laughs> to be on the meeting and I don't have to get up an hour early to get things done. And some people probably were saying, I, wow, you let me be home for a little bit. I actually unless my unless your name is Tom Brady, you probably do enjoy your family. <laughs> you're not rushing to get back out into the field. So you're probably like, wow, I, I like the people who I actually am in, in, in love. With. I have to see them more than just the weekend. And to give all that back up, to go right back into the 8, 10, 9, 12 hour days inside of the office with the commute time. I don't know. That's going to be a tough thing. I think that the, the one huge benefit out of this scenario is that well, gas prices are rising up. So if people are still working from home, hopefully they're not as impacted by at the fuel tank by the gas stuff. But I'm already going to tell you right now, people will rather quit than go into the office. They will For figure sure. it out. And I've, I've seen that. Like people are like, nah, it, it, people, they were, it was hard for, for jobs to find work in the first place. Right. So like people don't want to go to work during the pandemic during everything coming up. So I can't imagine how this is going to work out for some of these jobs. Like, I don't think a lot of this stuff is coming back unless they forcing it. Yeah. And then I, I think that a lot of, you know, a lot of people, if they have to go back and are forced to go back, you're going to have a, a heck of a work environment. That's going to be one. Imagine the DMV. Like, you you know how to hide the DMV. Like, everybody seems like they got an attitude. It's, that, it's going to be like that everywhere. Now, what Goldman was arguing is, and this is something I alluded to. So Solomon, which is God, he believes in in-person interactions are essential to the bank's apprenticeship culture. So Goldman, they, their company's operating model is like an ecosystem of the firm. It includes hiring 3,000 new college graduates every year who learn from experienced bankers and build networks face to face. It's going to be impossible for you to learn remotely. So that is an aspect of the game that's going to get destroyed or they need to pick. Like, how do you do that? Like if you brought in this new fresh face from college and he's going to be under this elite banker and the banker's remote, how, how, do, how can I train you remotely over Zoom? Like I'm missing out on what you do at lunch, the call that you that you took, how you dress that day, maybe the cologne that you wore, the perfume, like how do you exude yourself, right? Because if you're a college student, you don't have all this stuff coming out. You learn it on the job by kind of looking at folks like, oh, okay, this person dresses a certain way, they drive a certain way, they take a certain meeting, they eat at a certain place. You don't get that over Zoom. So now I'm curious on how that's going to work out in the long run if you know certain jobs, once again, how, how do you do your recruiting for remote work for new people? <laughs> like you can't keep everybody around. Right. All right. So let's keep um, it rolling. What we got next? We got, um, so, so next you know, we're talking about fees, fees, <laughs> fees everywhere. Fees. So Uber's adding a fuel cert with the rising gas prices. Uber is adding a fuel surcharge onto um, the the different rides, um, and even in Uber Eats, they're adding a fuel surcharge onto the deliveries as well. Yeah, I'm just gonna make me not have Uber Eats no more. I'm just gonna, like, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go pick it up myself because first of all, y'all was first of all, y'all y'all we, we went from ten nuggets to eight. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all burger. Who's it? Burger King and McDonald's. Y'all took t- two of my King. fake nuggets. We talked about that last week, and now y'all gonna charge me for fuel surcharge just to to Uber. So y'all created y'all. See, this is the part that's crazy. During the pandemic, this is where all these little joints came alive, right? Like, oh, the Uber Eats, the DoorDash, and now the platform is gonna be making all this money. And they got everybody hooked on like this gig economy, like, oh, you can have multiple side hustles. You can do your Toro. You can do your Airbnb. You can do your Uber Eats. You can do your DoorDash. You can do all that stuff. And then they just jack up the fees. They take more out of your pocket and then just pass it on to the consumer. So you're really not making as much as you was making in the first place. And then I'm not going to to use it. Like, why is my McDonald's number one, which I can go there and get it for seven bucks, now is $37 with all the service. <laughs> In, and then it's cold by the time you get it to well, you get it you're right make it right. make sense like, <laughs> i don't know something's gonna have to give it's, it's weird it's kind of like it is y'all, y'all forcing people to not use the stuff that seems so convenient because the convenience fee is super high that's like going to 7-eleven and get a get the soda from 7-eleven you know it's gonna be way more expensive at 7-eleven than the supermarket how is this any different like I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, what, I don't so, know. What, what what are your thoughts? I mean, do you use do you use um? Uber? I, I I use I use Uber a, a I little. I said bit. Uber Eats. We talking about Uber in general. So they was already getting high. So now that you add the the fuel charge on top of that, like now, like I might as well drive my own car if right. it's going to be three hundred dollars to get to the airport. The, yeah, especially in the area that I'm in, I don't use it too much um because the traffic here because. The traffic for one, I'd rather drive myself, and then for two, the fees to go around here because I'm near New York is the the fees automatically is is higher. So, and then Uber Eats, like you said, I I can just go get it myself. I'm in range of of the thing, so to add on another fee, um, I'd rather just go get it myself, especially because my fries gonna be cold. So, but here's the crazy part, though. They were saying that. Uber is even charging you a uh, the gas surcharge if it's an electric vehicle. Yeah, that's crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so so the the play here, people, is this: create the platform. You saw that TikTok. All I needed was the platform. Create the platform, and this be the pass through. You got to think about the people who make all the money are the platforms. If it's Stripe, right? If, think how Visa works. Visa, you got your credit card. This ain't a credit card, but say you got your credit card here, right? When you make a transaction, Visa gets a piece of the transaction, and they ju- it just passes through. Like you pay for a product, the the company marks up the product to pay for Visa or American Express fees. So Visa and American Express take their money and they put it in their pocket. If you're using Stripe, it's the same thing. I'm connecting people. You go through Stripe. I'm gonna charge you three percent. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna make money hand over fist. Same thing with Uber. Oh, I have this big network of people. You want to get from here to here. I'm going to connect you to them. And I'm going to take a fee, a platform fee, yada, yada, yada. Same thing with Toro. You want to rent out your car? No problem. You're going to put it on Toro. I have the algorithm. I'm going to prioritize everything with the highest fee. And I'm going to take my fees off it. Everybody who has the platform is killing it. Just the platform. I just needed the platform. The platform. So the crazy part is, with the gig economy, excuse my verb, uh, in California, because gas prices are so high, it doesn't even make sense to do Uber. Mm-hmm. How you gonna make? Like, you're not gonna make enough money to overcome the cost of seven dollar gas. The gas and then the traffic out there is crazy, so you might not even be getting enough rides to justify. It. You you're not gonna get enough rides to justify that on mm-hmm. on, on the traffic alone out there, and then gas prices is pushing seven. And that goes into effect tomorrow. So if you were planning on riding Uber this weekend, good luck because they're about to be charging you uh, a whole lot more. Yeah. Same thing with Lyft. You know, they all do the same thing and so on and so forth. But yeah, it's it's, it's interesting. So all, all the things that we grown to love during the pandemic, uh, uh, during the the lockdown, is coming back to bite people. Like you kind of get it's it's one of those scenarios where you kind of get used to something and then it's like they then the fees start coming so it's it's interesting on, on how that's rolled which which rolls right into the next thing democrats are are unveiling a bill to um 
to tax big oil's profits and send a check to the public. And um, before you before you get excited, um, the amount that they are are proposing is um, give me a second here. I just had it up. It for single filers, I believe it's uh, two hundred and forty dollars, and then for for joint filers, it is three hundred and twenty dollars, I believe. Yeah, three hundred and sixty dollars a year, hmm. and you only it's it's based on your income. So as a single father, you can only make you can make no more than uh, individuals who make more than seventy five thousand annually, and couples who make over one hundred and fifty thousand annually would get that two forty or three sixty a year. So, so at the end of the year, if you single, you get two forty, and if you're married, you get three sixty. Yeah, so you either they, get two. They doing everything for giving student loans, ain't they? <laughs> right. They, so what, what, they, they, what they told they us. They are doing everything but for giving them student loans. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we, the people don't want this. No. I'm going to tell you this right now, fam. <laughs> Listen, fam. They don't want that. You know, you know, what, the, you know what the people them want? <laughs> they want y'all to forgive student loans right like, y'all doing work. everything yeah y'all doing everything but the main thing what they say keep the main thing the main thing i guarantee you people don't want this they don't care they, this, this just <laughs> happened like if gas prices ain't go up then ain't nobody nobody care about this then like yo uncle joe where where these uh <laughs> where these uh where this forgiveness at it, exactly so the the dems is like yo <laughs> Gas on me. I got a tank on me. A, a tank Come or on, two man. on me. But here's the thing. I, I, midterm elections must be coming up because it ain't no way that this passes. You, you got to understand how politicians get funded. And a lot of that is through uh, oil companies. If you look at some of the big donors, come on now. I, I guarantee, like, this, is, this isn't even a non-starter. This is probably a talking point. So when someone says gas prices are high, what did you guys do? Oh, we proposed a bill that was going to get the consumer back money, cash right in their pocket. Da, da, da. So they can just kind of have that talking point for something. But they, they know that this, this ain't going to fly. And they're going to find a way to get it back from us. Exactly. Exactly. So what do you, you think is going to happen? <laughs> oh, since we're getting taxed now, then you think I just won't raise the, the price to ensure that that isn't covered like, add that to add that mean? 240 or 360 as as earned income in your taxes <laughs> so, so the part that i found hilarious on this was that the, the the they were saying what was the reason uh they said the reason was they didn't want to drive up the price of oil because of uh i guess the war but they let medicine be 20, 30, 40, 50 times the cost of like a pill. Like make that make sense. Like there's no reason why something that really costs five cents to make could be the consumers are charged like 900 bucks for this. You I, see what I, mean? I was, it was crazy. Like when I was in school, um, I fell on my wrist, like in basketball practice, they sent me down to the, to the doctor, gave me this wrist brace. So I'm like, oh, this looked like a, a like a wrist brace. I could have just went to CVS and get and got for for 15 bucks. They charge insurance. They charge four hundred and fifty dollars for that wrist brace. I looked at oh, the bill. I'm like, oh. is it, it was a difference. It was premium. The- <laughs> <laughs> it, was pre- it, was, it was a premium wrist brace oh, like yeah. like stuff like that like make that make sense that doesn't make any sense to me it's kind of no. like it, there's this this is this is the political stuff to to say for somebody somebody running pretty soon they want to say that i i tried to do something about this by introducing a bill which they know for a fact isn't going to pass but it, people it, it's weird like that all right, let's, let's talk about Bitcoin for a second, y'all. Um, so <laughs> this other one is like, so Bitcoin, so everything is going to crap, right? And this is the part that uh, me and Tommy was talking about this earlier. So everything is going to crap. We have a war breaking out. You have government trying to impose sanctions on another government entity. 
Um, they tried to impose restrictions on Bitcoin. Some of that passed. They're re- they're looking into how to do restrictions on Bitcoin. But so everything which Bitcoin was like created for, like the decentralization of stuff and to be separate and not controlled. And my I'm thinking it should be going crazy right now. Like when people were saying like 100K Bitcoin at the start of 2022, like I, I, I thought like these moments would cause it to continue to surge. But I'm looking at the chart of Bitcoin. It's pretty much mimicking the the stock market. It's kind of like correlated per se. It's been going up and down just as much as the, the freaking S&P is, is actually down uh, 14% year to date. If you look at the Bitcoin versus uh, Tether chart and over year over year, it's down 32%. So it's kind of like, why isn't Bitcoin surging to the moon in the times of crisis where uh, governments are floundering and war is going on and sanctions are occurring and inflation is high? Like, it, it, like it's, it's weird. It's kind of like it went crazy last year. But during the times when we have all that, we have like this storm of negativity for the dollar and the economy it's relatively flat or actually down, down 14%. It's down just as much as the S&P 500. It seems like it's kind of correlated to me, which wasn't and, making any sense. It don't, because this was the moment it's supposed to be made for, and this and business is not booming. <laughs> right. So if, if you look at it, it's kind of like, I, I don't understand. So any, anyone have a clue on why Bitcoin isn't Bitcoining? Why, why, why is, a, is, is it? Is that everyone's so scared at the moment that they're just kind of like holding on to their, their purse strings? Because if money is flowing out of the stock market, it ain't, it ain't no real estate to buy. <laughs> and it's not going to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is down. So is it is the retail investor just out of money? Is it moving to possibly other projects? Maybe that's the reason. Because, you know, a lot of people are into NFTs now, a lot of people are into other coins now. So it's not like 2008 where you kind of only had like Bitcoin, Ethereum and a few others. But I'm just shocked. I'm, I'm, I'm truly shocked that in the time where all the negative stuff is going on, Bitcoin is relatively, it's actually negative on the year. So it seems like it's, it's, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Um, <laughs> Dorothy says decentralized, not sure who's controlling that. Uh, so it's not doing technically what it's supposed to do in an uh, inflationary environment for the dollar. I truly expected it to go crazy at this point in time, but uh, that's the market for you. That's interesting. Um, it doesn't seem to be playing a central role in a global economy that's unraveling, which is weird, which is very, very weird. All right. Um, oh, censorship. So for my business owners here, you, you guys will hear me say this a lot. Uh, you want to own your your contacts. You want to own your list, right? So, one uh, Instagram used to be my biggest platform. Around 2019, I randomly woke up to was banned. Didn't get it back to like 2021. Sucked wholeheartedly. Imagine losing everything you're doing was on everything I was doing was on Instagram, and I just woke up one day like, hey, you got a copyright strike, which I don't even know what it was. And I was banned for like two years, gone. So the same thing is now happening to on the to the Russian side of the house, right? So I believe Instagram was allowing hate speech against Russians. And then Russia decided to block all Russians from being able to use Instagram, which brings to the point. Instagram is the meta is a private company, so they can kind of do what they do. Twitter did their thing when they removed uh, presidents and certain people off of their platform. It seems like Instagram is doing the same thing too. What is your opinion on how certain things are, are being played out now, right? I understand the war is going on, but from my understanding, Russia decided to remove all Russians access to Instagram because Instagram allowed a, uh, I guess a break in their policy for hate speech. Yeah, so the policy was um, uh, the policy that fit, that Meta has is uh, is a policy against inciting violence, um, and they made an exception to that policy so long as the post represented 
political expression against Russian forces um, invading the Ukraine. So that's why Russia, they said, okay, we ain't, we not dealing with that. So we cancel it. We, we, our people not using it. See, this is a part that, that that's weird because it's kind of like people, they be picking and choosing what they're going to allow. Right. I'm not on any side of it, but it's kind of like, wow, how do you live? one thing or how you be so hard on one thing and then i can't even put certain words in my own facebook posts like <laughs> like at one point in time they were censoring me for saying like shut up or uh or saying a cuss word or something like that and then you let a whole nother group just have their way with another group and then if the other group tries to say something you banning them off for hate speech and something like, so on and so forth like that i, I don't know i think I think this is why people are kind of gun ho on Web 3.0. So Web 2.0 is like you have all these individual companies owning everything, right? You got your Facebook, you got your Googles, you got your, your Apples, your Microsoft. They own all the data. They own all the data, right? So everything we're on, either Google, uh, Apple, Microsoft, or Facebook has some form of interaction with it. 90% of the stuff you use is controlled by maybe those four or five companies. Web 3.0 was more so decentralized aspect of things. Like it's in the web. Nobody owns it. Um, so on and so forth. But I just don't like how I just don't like how it is so wishy washy. Like, it, what is it? Is 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 black or white? You can't you keep switching up the rules and stuff like that. And this brings on like the business side of the house. Like, they will just wake up one day and say, "Hey, you're in this type of industry. We don't allow it. <laughs> like, you can't talk about credit on our platform. TikTok has that going on. Uh, you can't talk about." Um, uh, certain types of finances on this particular platform um but they allow completely other things so i just think it's more so like a, a wishy-washy thing but it's interesting that russia is like it, it's basically removing access to instagram from all russian access i'm not sure how how that's going to impact them i know facebook or, or meta has a huge wide impact on that but it sounds like Russia is about to be completely on their own. Stock markets cl closed. They have no social media platform unless you use the Russian one. Um, their their dollar is the, the ruble uh, is down to pretty much nothing. I'm not sure what's going to happen at the end of all of this. Right. So if you have sanctions, censorship and your economy collapse, how can you financially survive as a superpower? And, and you have no communication. Methods and, because and, everyone's going to treat you like so. There's no Twitter. There's no. There's no Instagram. There's there's going to be TikTok. There's no Google. Google's doing it too. So how do how do your people get information? I think we talked about this last week, where like certain sanctions or certain access to things uh, tend to really really hurt you. Like imagine imagine your life. You had no Google, no Microsoft, no Apple, and no Facebook. <laughs> what, are you, what are you using? What, what are you using? Like, how do you communicate with people? So we've become so reliant on certain things that if if these private companies decide to truly censor you, it's nothing that you can do. Keep in mind, remember, the president of the United States was gone, nixed. You couldn't actually you couldn't communicate on social media platforms. That's crazy. That's 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 crazy. All right. So let's finish it off with this one. Um <laughs> what is the minimum amount of money you should have in a savings account, like an emergency fund, right? So what do you think the minimum amount is? Uh, so uh, let me just ask you, Tommy. So where you are now, what do you think is the minimum amount in savings for in cash for an emergency fund that you should have? For, for me, is um, the rule that I go by is it's anywhere between, you know, at least three months of my what I call must have expenses. So three between three and six months of my my must haves, which to me are things that are either going to leave me, you know, like if I don't pay them is going to impact my credit or is going to, you know, impact my uh, my my way of living, you know, mm -hmm. my um yeah, my, my, you know, my, my, uh, way, way of living. So if it's like, Hey, I don't, you know, I need to have my rent, of course, you know, utility. So, um, if I had a car note, uh, you know, that would be a must have, cause that would impact my credit. So, so things like that, as long as I have three to six months of those set aside for, you know, a rainy day, that's what I consider, uh, a quality emergency fund for me. 
I think I, I, I kind of agree with that too. I will throw in another wrinkle and this is fairly new for me. I think now um, you also should um, factor in your credit into your emergency fund. Mm -hmm. Cause if you have a budget, it, like I think cash and credit and budgets in emergency crash credit budgets to me are kind of like all that same basic financial principles. But if you have $700, if you have 700 credit score and you have access to credit cards, you technically could have access to cash to pay your expenses. You can kind of float yourself, right? So outside of having at least 60 days, right? You want to give yourself at least 60 days of all your bills so you can possibly interview for jobs and things like that. You can stretch that completely probably to another three to nine months off your credit as well. Now, ideally, you want to have that six to nine month in cash, and then you want to get your credit up, but you can also stretch that to a year if you need be in a push come to shove. You know, you can live off your credit cards, moving some things around. But I, I like that. I like that three to six months. Start at like at least two months, though. Like if you got two months of your expenses, must haves are things that you must pay for, right? Regardless of having income coming in or not. I'm not talking about the the high old cable bill and stuff like that. I'm talking about like your rent, your lights, your food and things like that. Once you know that actual number and you get that in there, I think you're good. And then the rest of it, you should be able to like, your goal from that point on is to, to never ever have to use your emergency fund. <laughs> like that should be like the, the, the goal at the end of the day. Um, Tamara yeah. says, I plan to build my email list. They are separate as, the, as China. All right. So uh, we're at the, the, we at the, what, the one hour mark or so. So yeah. let's move into some questions. So what questions do you guys have? If you have any questions, I would love to bring you guys up to answer them. Um, just keep in mind, everyone's going to hear my response and hear your question as well. So if you got a question, just raise your hand and we can bring you up. Um, yeah, I was trying to say cost, uh, quality of living. I don't know why I couldn't. It was it just kept drawing a blank. You said quality of living. Quality what, of living. Yeah. If it. What if, was that in reference to? To my my um emergency fund. So it's things that if it like the food, the you know things like that. If it impacts my my quality of living, you know that's something I consider a a must have. Like food, uh, the the utilities and, and rent things like that. If I if I don't pay rent, I'm be homeless. So that impacts my quality of living right there. So that's uh, what I see. What, that's what I, I see what you mean. So I like to throw a little bit of extra things in the must haves too, like certain things that I'm gonna do regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but like I don't think you should give up everything in your budget, right? You kind of got a budget in the fun stuff. So if it's something that makes your life easier, makes you happy as a person, I consider that quality of living as well. Um, that could be as simple as a, a subscription to maybe you're like a Peloton person, right? You, you say, I need to have my Peloton membership. It's $39 or $30 or whatever it is. So even if you didn't have your job, you may consider you, you probably should work out. Right. So certain things like that, like, or oh, I got to have Netflix. Like is Netflix something that you're going to give up, right? If you're a TV person, that $10, that's something that you keep in your budget or not. Um, looks like we got a hand up. Who's it? So let's promote Dorothy, Dorothy up. Let's uh, see if we can answer her question. Gotcha. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Dorothy, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm well. Hey, um, I have a question. Um, I I decided I wanted to look for some time, so take some time off work, and look for something. Um to be able to work from home. Um, and I kind of exhausted all my funds in trying to start something and I didn't pay for my mortgage and it just dropped my credit like bad. You said you didn't pay your mortgage? Yeah, for 30 days, the so last month. <laughs> so my credit just crashed, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just got a property that I wanted to purchase that I'm able to get a uh, seller financing for half of it. And so I was trying to see if I could access my equity of, of the house for about like about 100K. Um, but I guess I didn't qualify because of the, the, um, the credit crash. What can I do? Just some ideas. Um, I would say you can call the bank. 
and see if they can give you a, a like ask for like a goodwill, see if they can remove it. Um, okay. you call them up, give them a story or something like that. Ideally, they're probably gonna want the money though. Um, no, but- I already, I already, I already paid. I just, um, I already paid. I'm, I'm up to date. It's just that I did lag behind because I was trying to also get the finances to get this, um, other property too. Gotcha. I would say call, call your bank up immediately and just explain your situation to see if they're willing to work with you. Um. Mm-hmm. If you catch it earlier enough, sometimes you can get it reversed, but that's going to be a tough one to overcome, right? Because late payments are 35% of your score, like 192 points on the credit scoring algorithm. And it's going to look pretty bad if you're trying to get another mortgage or any loan related to a house and you had a late payment, recent late payment. Like typically loan officers don't like to see late payments in the last 12 months, six to 12 months, and you got a recent one. It could be tough. So I will call the bank up immediately and see if they will work with you. Okay. I would say, and then going forward, if you can be 29 days late, you can't be 30 days late. Right. So going forward, I would say uh, if you know that you're not going to make the minimum payment, call your uh, lender up immediately. See, maybe they can move it to the back of it. Uh, Maybe they could give you some form of grace or something. So you don't ever have that late payment. But I'm pretty sure your, your score dropped 50 to 100 points with that late payment. Mm-hmm. Thank you. No problem. I'm going to try tomorrow. Yeah, call them. Call, and if, they, if they say no, call them back. <laughs> There's a possibility that you can get somebody else that's kinder. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Um, that was a, that's unfortunate that you got the, the late payment. Uh, one thing I would say, folks, if if you're going to don't just quit your job to pursue something, right? Like use your job as your first investor of, of some sort until you figure it out. Like sometimes it's better to work a little bit tired than I'm not a huge fan of, you know, we're just going to move off faith. Like I, I, I tend to move off minimum valuable products and and things that are proven, right? So going to kind of take that as a lesson from Dorothy, like you might be in a situation that you don't like to be in, but it's better than, you know, kind of jumping out there. And then you run into a situation where you end up missing a payment on your mortgage. It hurts your credit, which could hurt your future prospects and your future deals. Right. So at a minimum, try to do the other thing while you have some steady income coming in or build up a large, large nest egg before you roll like two years worth of expenses before you roll out um, and and give it a shot that way. So I appreciate you guys. This was a a pretty great talk and I'll be seeing you guys next, next Tuesday. (laughs) All right. Peace out.